Hi, I'm Emily Gong, and this is Beyond Codes and Aesthetics, a podcast series of Art Focus Spoken, where we feature the voices of international artists, curators, and scientists in exploring innovative possibilities that engage with society through art and science. Hi, and welcome to Beyond Codes and Aesthetics podcast. On today's episode, we are excited to speak with Yi Shen. Born and raised in Fujian Province, China, Yishen Chen received her bachelor's degree in English, Language, and Literature from Beijing Foreign Studies University and her master's degree in Visual Art at Camberwell College of Art, University of Arts London. Based in London and Shanghai, Chen's work has been selected for exhibitions in London, Oxford, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Changsha, and many others. Holding an academic background in linguistics and sociology, Chen continuously develops a cross-disciplinary study with a rich sense of art and philosophy. She mainly works with artists' books, performance, sound art, and installation. To explore a more undefined realm of expression, Chen started the practice with both art and tech as a curator who focuses on the field of digital art. She has been collaborating with artists from all over the world since 2019. Chen's previous curation and production projects include the opening exhibition of Aranya Art Center After Colors, Shimmel 30th Anniversary Theme Exhibition 30 Under 30, and touring exhibition Parallelism and Futurism, which just opened earlier this month. So thanks so much for joining us today, Shen. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Hello, Emily. It's it's really good to speak with you. And congratulations on your recent show, Parallelism Futurism. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. I saw some snippets of um, the show, and it seems quite otherworldly with lots of robotic digital senses. And how was the opening event and your experience with it? Mm, Yeah. um, It... It was the first curation project of 2020, so it was really exciting. And it was a really huge hit in Shanghai since the COVID. So, um, you know, China has just recovered a bit (laughs) from the quarantine. And it is rare to have this kind of large event, large offline exhibitions like that so uh, basically we have a really we have a perfect um, a perfect space which is totally dark and can with controllable light and uh, entrance and everything and it was large and we set up 100 uh, digi- digital sculptures in there with the yeah with the shape of Buddha so the the uh, it, it was a collaboration of two artists. Uh, one is Dabei Yu Zhou. Dabei Yu Zhou is a really excellent 3D artist who created all the figures uh, combined with the cyborg uh, style and the uh, Buddha. And even more, more things more than that, uh, that we will work on later. And uh, also, the installation was made and programmed by a really creative agency uh, or a group called NAP, N-A-P-E, NAP. So I work with a curator to make this happen, including uh, raising the foundings and finding the space and, uh, yeah, and help with uh, the, this, like the uh, installation uh, programming up. Uh, which is basically just layout because I, I know not I know little things about programming so I uh, work with them to have this image and uh, we do some promotion online and both online and offline this time and also we manage to invite um, artist or maybe like what we call a magician a singer called Akini Jin, who is really popular now in China, in mainland China. Um, she always wants to collaborate with uh, artists who make these kind of cyborg styles. And uh, she also wants to explore more about the uh, collaboration between um, installation and uh, singing performance. So this is how it happened. I think it will be more easier to picture this 
exhibition by showing you some uh, some videos maybe yeah yeah a little bit cool so So the big so, ring at the top, is it kind of like a halo? Yes, I would say it was more like a halo on, on your top. So um, I think it's connected. It has this kind of abstract conversation with the sculptures. So uh, we won't describe this installation, the whole installation, as a religion, uh, 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 as a religion one, it has nothing to do with the with the story or something else. We're talking about the posthumanism. We talk talk about the posthumanism in this story. So uh, I would like to share uh, something else, uh, which is the uh, preface of this exhibition. I find yeah. it fascinating the symbolism that they chose, that the artists chose to represent this futurism. Because mm -hmm. like you said, it looks like uh, like there's a lot of elements from traditional Buddha sculptures in exactly. the physiognomy of its face. Um, mm -hmm. But also it looks kind of like hyper real in a sense. And you can tell that how when there's, you know, so many of them placed side by side, kind of this pattern that it creates is yeah. really, really striking. And I um, spent a summer in the Gobi Desert at Dunhuang in the caves. Yeah. Oh. Yes, and I remember that in the caves, because I think in Western, um, like when there's depictions of angels, the halo is on the top of the head like this, right? Um, but then here, the halo is behind its head like a circle this way. Right, <laughs> yeah. and then that's kind of what I saw, and how uh, different colors of light would emit from the head mm -hmm. in the cave paintings. But here, it kind of is a minimalistic depiction of that because there's only one ring around, and it's very, very like dominant light. Um, so I think it's, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the light uh, on the top of that can be a uh, can represent more like how you feel is 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 much beyond the back halo of the Buddha of the sculpture is more like because it's so large it has like a six meter diagram it is so large so so basically uh, all the lights were provided by the halo uh, on the top of that. So we built up this curation framework based on the mm, post-humanism. So uh, 
as we all know that we are always talking about the new exist not or the new form of what human could be what human being could be so especially in this kind of quarantine time what are we what um, what defines us is that my that we are really are or the form we are really are just like when we're talking to each other what are we are we the artificial figures that uh, the shown in zoom or the mind that we are talking to Emily talking to Yishan what can really be the real me the, the real nature of us so sometimes it's pretty depressing just like the feeling that I have at the really start of the quarantine so I start to question what is art and the value of art and what are we what can we do with this so I think this exhibition um, that collaborated with Abe Yuzhou and Nat is the answer of all so we would like to discuss that how we respond to this work and talk about how we are going to be next with this installation. That's what we want to say. Fascinating though, like all of the more philosophical questions that I think through quarantine especially, there's a lot of deep introspection that all mm -hmm. of us have in one way or another gone through. And yeah. kind of these are the themes that you work with in this particular piece. And I know that you were involved in this project since day one in the funding stage. And so I'm really curious, um, was this kind of, because this happened, did it start before COVID? And like, how did it evolve in the time of COVID in terms of like the philosophies that is imbued in the art? Um, I would think that actually we live in this kind of era that COVID is everywhere. <laughs> so. In the very beginning, we did not think about how COVID is, how COVID would be involved in this project. But by the end of that, that we realized it suddenly just hit me that the idea of that we are both influenced. We 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 receive this severe impact of COVID. We almost lose the confidence to keep on our lives. So we have to do something. We have to have this faith to believe in believe in something and as an artist as a curator what how or what can we believe in art so we should never doubt the the, the, the value of art so, so we make art to deliver this kind of faith deliver this kind of confidence to keep our life going on so I think that's how COVID um, have this impact on us it did not defeat us. <laughs> we have our questions. So when talking about the COVID, um, by like half a year ago, maybe eight months ago, I've been through a really hard time. I think for both of us, we've been through a really hard time. I live in like a huge attack of depression and rage. I, I start to question about the value of art. I start to question about what can I do as as an artist? Should I do something else with another prisoner, with another identity, just like the normal people? But um, and also I think about how can we do with art to talk about this thing? And should art, should all art be relevant to this special time? So my answer is not necessarily because it will be <laughs> no matter what you do it will be definitely related to this topic so because you live in this time you, you can't escape that's why i think yeah that's really well said i think um i've also had a similar experience i think there's a lot of questions during covid about what is the purpose of art on one hand people feel like art should you know uplift and give so much hope um and kind of inspire people in these dark times and then all of a sudden artists had this you know like overbearing role that they their art needs to do something revolutionary for people 
But on the other hand, art is also deemed as non-essential. It, you know, art organizations, their closing and reopening is kind of the last phase because it's deemed as non-essential. So then it's like a balance, you know, like it's kind of contradicting in a way, but it's really cool to see the project that you've made and developed over quarantine. So the, the, this project, when did it all begin? Uh, it all began like three months ago when my friend called me and said, hey, yeah, it's just three months ago. So two of my best friends from NAP, like, like, like gave me a call, like gave me a call and say, hey, Ethan, we got a big project to do. Would you like to join? I was like, what is that? And they say, we want to have like 100 Buddha hot sculpture in one space and make a performance. Would you like to join? I say, yeah, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> so because um, after the uh, quarantine, I haven't, I haven't had any thing exhibited in a real space. So I really value the chance, the opportunity to do some offline, some, something solid, something tangible, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, uh, as a digital art curator, I know that it will be easier or it probably the best time for 3D artists to post their uh, works online. But I still value the chance to do something that I can touch, I can physically see. <laughs> so uh, it gave me that since they gave me this chance and invite me to do this project, I was like, let's just do this. I, I can't, I can't wait to see this happen. And and I think the difference between these online uh, digital artworks and the offline digital artwork. Their vibes are totally different. It's just like on this kind of cyber time, cyber time, this cyberspace, you can see Mona Lisa, the painting, everywhere, every time, anytime you want. But it's really different when you see it offline in the museum. It's totally different. So, so I think it also works. This also works in digital art exhibitions, offline exhibitions. So your mood will be influenced, your mood will be changed when you are in this space. If the light, like this light that I have in his, here, is, is yellow. And when it changed to red, the mood just changed suddenly. And I can change it anytime. You see a small source of light can have this kind of change. So not to mention in the large space with large halo uh, light rings and 100 sculptures, the feeling would be totally different. Like you are not in this world, just, <laughs> just you, like you've mentioned, we are not in this world. And I think that's what art can bring us to create an undefined experience, to create something that you would never see online or something you could never feel in your daily life and something that could give you one more way to enjoy the war you're living so that's what i want to do uh, that's what i say yes <laughs> immediately to them that's amazing and even speaking with you i think you curate an experience even through, you know, like the light that you have and your microphone. Um, so I think this is just really a part of you. But I know that um, curation is something that you've more recently got into. I know that uh, in London, when you were studying, you were more focused on creating and performing as an artist yourself. And then what about after moving to Shanghai? Like, how did you kind of become exposed to curating and also digital art? I think I've always trying to find something that could help me naturally express my feeling. So originally I work as an artist. I very beginning choose book as the way I make things because I think book is easier to copy, easier to like to publish and easier to talk. Um, it, and it, it was cheap, <laughs> it was cheap, so it would be a really 
uh, starter friendly. So I started to do books. And then I found myself pretty fascinated with the sound because I think sound is um, pretty similar to books. I, I call it audiobook <laughs> because sound to me is an audio form of book. Um, it could be private, like you can read a book alone and you can listen to this video clip, this audio clip alone is private. And it could also be uh, public, like you publish your books and it would be uh, delivered to any, anywhere in the world. And uh, just like the voice can be published online and any anyone can listen to this. And uh, so I switched to the sound a little bit, but I think sound sometimes is not enough for my expression. So I add a bit of performance because uh, I feel pretty free when I use myself as a tool in my performance. So as a performer, I can have several personalities. I can be anyone. I can be anything. And I feel natural to do that. So that's why I choose these three ways. And as well as the installation. Installation is more like a, some, some something. Uh, happening when I'm not there <laughs> is like another pre representative of me. So that's why I choose this uh, mediums. So when I moved to Shanghai, I worked for an agency, uh, also a platform called Output. Output is who aims to uh, work with top uh, digital art artists uh, from all over the world and uh, they curate a lot of amazing exhibitions in China, including uh, the last last year, uh, the, the one that I am, get involved in uh, is the opening ceremony in Arena Art Center, Art Center. And also they have a really amazing show, a digital show in Forbidden City <laughs> last year. So uh, I think it makes something that you seen, that I think, was traditional. They bring them to life again. And it was fascinating. And it's easier to understand. Just like when I was doing the concept art, the contemporary art, many people will find it, oh my God, it's so confusing. I can't understand it. It's so hard to understand. And I don't think it is something that I want. I always want, I would always consider art to me is a language. A language that should be uh, talk to anyone that I would like to talk. It should not be uh, like a difficult language that only created for me. So I think that inter uh, digital art just opened the door for me, a door that bring me to a more interactive, immersive, and uh, easier to communicate way. So to to my audience, to the to my target audience. So I think. Uh, uh, and I also found that I can, I can work with the artist as a curator. I can be a different, different character in different role, play a different role in this uh, practice. So uh, it'll be. It's it's like, I'm I'm getting familiar with this 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 technique because I can learn a lot from them. So I I will create my own digital works later, maybe next year but uh, I still have a lot of things to learn so I would like to work more with them and I would like to see how people uh, consider how people think about digital art because it's so new it has so so many different forms it has so many techniques uh, it has so many to explore so I'm part of that I'm still learning um, curation project is all is also the, the, the way that I choose to learn so that's why I make this change. That's really exciting. Thanks for sharing. And I think it's really incredible seeing the boom of different collaborations within digital art, especially in China. I feel like the landscape, it's really like happening really quickly. And there's such a wealth of different types. Um, can we just talk a little bit about kind of what this digital art landscape in China looks like? And what are some, like, I guess, different types of collaboration? Um, because I think with tech and art, 
people will also have the question of is art servicing tech or is tech servicing art or what is the relationship between the two so what are like i guess from your experience like your opinions and ideas on this so uh, i would like to uh, answer to the first question the first question is about um what's the digital art landscape in china so I can only tell you about the landscape of Shanghai <laughs> because I, I live in Shanghai. I, I, I don't know the landscape of other area, other cities, but in Shanghai, it works pretty well. People are getting more and more familiar with different kind of uh, forms of digital arts. For example, uh, when you went to the club, they have this kind of laser, pro uh, laser projection. They have this kind of DJ and VJ. Um, that create uh, pretty uh, ab abstract uh, images and uh, music. It, it's not like this kind of boom, 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 just just really simple uh, techno music to dance. It's more like an uh, um, explosion of this kind of uh, experimental uh, sound art. So this was happening in some um, top... Uh, like club, like for for KW, like all. Uh, so Shanghai has this kind of space for the young artists to uh, exhibit, to show their works to the audience. And Shanghai has this kind of certain group of audience who can understand this, who 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 love this. So I think there's a really good start. And the other kind of uh, digital art platform is that more and more. Um, art museum are, uh, are getting familiar and they are accepting new media art in their space. Like uh, last year, from what I've known, uh, so many are so many digital art artists. Their work has been exhibited in Hell Hell Art Museum and Tank, as well as um, M. MCAM also, or the museum, and also as PSA, and as well as, well as OCAT. So uh, it's a good sign that art muse museum are accepting more and more kinds of medium in in this time, and and also <laughs> uh, from uh, the most commercial ones, even the co most commercial ones, the. Uh, the, the museum, the exhibition shows happening in shopping mall. So these kind of <laughs> shopping mall exhibitions are more down to earth because their audience, uh, normal people who know maybe nothing about techniques and art, they just want to feel and have fun and take pictures. But even for them, I think art and tech is still a really fascinating um, interest to them because they want all of us. Uh, we want something look beautiful. We want something that could have more close connection with us. And I think art and tech, the combination of art and tech, can bring this to us. For example, if I want to explore a beautiful painting, all I want to do is not just looking at them. I want to touch them. I want to know if the, what would happen if I touch them. I want to hear the sound if I touch them. I think it's a more diverse way to explore traditional art. If we turn this painting into a digital art form, that's what we could bring to the noble public. So I think everyone deserves the right to explore this, not only the people who has already in this artwork. So from uh, one thing that I know in the quarantine is the art market might be fragile. <laughs> I mean, this kind of capital games, but art is not. Art will not stop growing. So as long as we love this kind of beauty of life, art will not die. So I think um, the combination of art and tech could certainly bring more possibilities to make the art uh, getting more approach to normal people, to other people. So that's what I think. And I would like to answer the second question is that what is the balance of art and technology? 
So from what I think, I think a good work uh, that has the good balance in art and technology is that art should not leave. Um, is uh, how 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 can I describe this? Is that in this work, the art part cannot leave the tech part, and the tech part cannot leave without the art part. They need each other. So if art is totally driven by technologies, for example, if you found something, wow, I think this tech is so great, and I want to make an art piece by that, I think art is totally driven by technology. And if um, these technol, uh, if you find something art uh, really fascinating, and you desperate to find some technology to fulfill that, you will probably fail because. Technology is the, the tech is still growing. You sometimes you have to comp uh, compromise because we haven't achieved that level that you can do anything you want. So I think it's the good balance is these two things cannot live without each other, and uh, these two things should serve to each other. That's why I think a good artwork with technology should be. That's really well put. Thank you. Are there examples of this type of collaboration that you've seen recently that really stuck out to you in your mind? Um, I would like to introduce a group that I really love. Uh, it's from Poland. Uh, the name is Pan Generator. P A N Generator. Pan Generator. So I think their work bring the bring me a, a sense of um fun <laughs> they, they have this kind of uh, pretty uh, clean uh, aesthetics styles and uh, their purpose is, is really clear uh, it's really clear so uh, probably I can show you from the meal of their works pun generator so this one is they use a not really difficult tech techniques, but in a really smooth and serious way to present what should be played seriously. So you can see all those cards, they are like the, the, the solid, the, the tangible archives. You can choose whatever clips they want to see, like someone's live, and you just put it on the installation this kind of uh, interactive device will sense that and you can just use the scroller to scroll all the digital archives of these people. This is so moving. So moving. Yeah. I was shocked when I first time uh, when I first uh, have a look of this one because I think it's a really talented way making use of the digital form to 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 show what should be shown what should be shown uh, seriously. So as we all know, this history is something that we want to uh, take it like. Uh, in a respect way. So it's pretty clean. It was pretty neat. It, it can pre present to any anyone who visited in this uh, museum. And it's not like showing off of how good we are in these techniques. It's a perfect combination of art and uh, history and uh, technology. So with the digital form, these archives could be uh, could be managed in a perfect layout, like uh, the the picture part and the uh, text part, and uh, also you have unlimited space to add on more text or more archives, and it has no limits, like uh, the library or something. All you need is is one more clip, and you can go here we go, and you can have more and more archives of this one. So I think this would be an example 
a good example uh, to uh, illustrate what is a good example of what is the good work uh, of the combination of art and tech. This is the the the, the first one that pop <laughs> just pop in my mind. It's so moving, like even though we're just watching it through a screen. So, did you first see it in person, or also just on the screen? Also on the screen. And so uh, last year, I get in touch with Pan Generator. Uh, I, I get in touch with the, uh, the the member of them, and they visited China. So uh, they did some collaboration with the Opera Agency this year in Shenzhen. Wow how how so, was how was meeting them in person? Yeah, they are really creative. <laughs> they they want to they want to uh, just spend every minute to talk about possibilities, to talk about what should be done uh, in this new place. They are really interested in doing things in China. I think that China has a lot of possibilities and people uh, have this kind of um, interesting ideas towards techni techniques and people here are full of imagination. So uh, I think months ago, they just finished a uh, uh, a, a collaboration, a collaborative project in Shenzhen, in Shenzhen Airport. It was a data analysis-based uh, interactive installation. Um, but I, I mean, if you come to Shenzhen Airport someday, it was a permanent one, uh, founded by uh, Tencent, the the may, maybe the biggest internet company in China, founded by Tencent. Uh, so. It will be, I think they would have following project in China later. I think I see it actually. It's called Shimmering Pulse. Exactly. Shenzhen Maidong. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Okay, we'll attach the link underneath then. Because I also just want to like learn more about, because I think it's really interesting how you navigate all of this from different positions. You're yourself first an artist and then a curator. And was this shift like, how did it happen, and was it difficult? It was difficult. <laughs> it was really difficult. Even now, I'm trying to balance my artist life and curation, uh, curator life, because it was totally different. But because as an artist, what uh, what you think, uh, what you should think about is how to make things, how to how to manage your words to say. In your work, but as a curator, you gonna make things happen in real world. It's different. So, as a curator, you have to think about more realistic problems, like how can I get the foundings? How can I find a proper context? How I <laughs> do the promotion? How I uh, how how I gather all the appropriate uh. How I get the most match uh, artists together, and how can I manage their works together and make uh, and, and let it make sense? That's what a curator should think about. It will be more complicated. But as a artist, um, my work is more like a research based uh, creation. So. Basically, my job would be reading, <laughs> maybe reading and thinking and writing and uh, making experiments. That's it. It sounds simple, but it takes a lot of time and and, and money. But so what I what I think the, mo the, the the most significant difference between being a curator and being an artist is curator is thinking about how to gathering money, <laughs> and but but as an artist, what I should think about is how I how I spend every penny of my myself. <laughs> I think that's the most significant difference of all. <laughs> so, but it was really, it was difficult because um, this kind of two characters would share uh, time, my personal time, my, my work hours and my, you know, my, my strengths. So uh, I think after this curation project that just happened um, days ago, I would focus, I would maybe spend uh, one or two months uh, doing my job, doing my own work. So my next 
work would also be in sound installation, a sound interactive. Uh, in some interactive installation that maybe includes lighting a uh, firework. <laughs> oh, so is, it, is it the yeah, yeah. Paul? Like the... Yeah, exactly. The damp cracker oh. one. Yeah. So I would light the cracker. <laughs> Literally light the cracker. Really, um, work on feminism too. Yeah, um, that would I'm... be the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be the last last piece of work of this project. So I'm now doing um, like a cultural study, uh, uh, also the social, uh, social studies. Like I want to explore this kind of fire worship tradition, the, the relationship between fire worship tradition and the, the gender power system. I think it, it has some connections, but I haven't found out what the connections really are and why we have this kind of connection. So I'm still doing some reading these days. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating project. I remember when you first told me about it, I was really, really just shook. Um, and essentially just to sum it up a bit, I think you can probably do a better job than me. Um, but the idea behind it, isn't it that uh, when a child is born in um, where, you, where you were born, your hometown, then if it's a boy, then fireworks go off. Is that right? But that's only, fireworks only go off if it's a boy. Is that correct? Yeah, so I'm the first one born with the fireworks. <laughs> the first girl. The first right. girl that born with the fireworks. So thanks, thanks to my dad. <laughs> thanks to my dad a lot. Yeah, and... Uh, I'm just really excited to see how this work when you're when it comes out. So please keep us updated on it. Um, and I, I just think it's amazing how you can balance all of these things. I remember when I was inviting you for this podcast, you were saying, "Yeah, sure, I'm getting on a plane to uh, was it Guangzhou or somewhere um, to install yeah, the heads." Sense. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, it's quite amazing. And I think also in terms of the length. Um, of mm -hmm. how this project could, you know, from beginning to end, take place in three months. And it seems like mm -hmm. um, the art scene in Shanghai is very dynamic. So mm -hmm. through um, your previous job, you've had experience as a curator, and it seems like people know you in the kind of in the art world there. And so they'll reach out to you for projects as a curator or as the artist. Is that right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and just... I, I guess it's kind of crazy to think how a project like that can take off in three months. I think three months is a pretty limited time period for this project because I think if we have more time next, next uh, in the next tour, we would definitely definitely develop more kind of uh, more forms of the uh, illustration. Because I think 100 sculptures can have a lot of possibilities. So once we we want to make a tower, <laughs> the seven meters high tower, to contain these sculptures, but it was too complicated and difficult, and it would spend a lot of money. So we decide to postpone it and try the most easy, the, the, the easiest way. Uh, for the first time so just step by step and i think we could create more um, create uh, create more fascinating forms next time so that's what i think so yeah. and also sorry sorry to interrupt in, interrupt mm -hmm. so also uh curating all these digital exhibitions bring me new ideas of my own work for example in the the damp quaker project uh originally i as you know, as I want to say, I used to do artist book and I used to do sound, uh, sound works, and I used to film some performance and also some live performance. But in the, in the last work uh, that I just mentioned, I want to add some text in, in this one because I think uh, add a little bit interactive tricks can bring some new experience to the audience. For example, I want to, uh, that's just a proto prototype of the, 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 
of this work. I want to make create a, a room where you somehow step in a point and in another space, in another part of the space, the this kind of booming would just yell in this space. You, you have no idea when you would step on this spot and you have no idea where the sound would go off. So that's what I want to create in this space. And all this will be triggered by technologies, by this kind of, um, um, this kind of uh, LR, IR, um, I don't know, just, just a kind of uh, interactive triggers that I set up that program before. Uh, from first sound hearing it, initially it sounds like anxieties in contemporary society. Yeah, <laughs> like you have no idea. Probably you will be shocked. And that's what I want people to feel. So if uh, with all these technologies, with all these knowledges of digital art, I would never come up with these new ideas of my work. So thanks to that. <laughs> thanks to the previous experience. It's really great and fascinating to hear how you've made it go hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, I'm curious for your current, the project that you just did, uh, what mm -hmm. were, I guess, um, some elements of it? Um, wait, let me rephrase that. So in the project mm -hmm. that you just did, um, kind of like what was the breakdown of audience members that could attend the opening rather and which, like how many streamed it online oh, 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 sorry what well, i didn't i did not quite get it okay so uh for your recent uh exhibition so uh how many actually audience members saw it live in person like went to see the show and then were mm. did you guys also stream it online and what was the viewership like i'm just kind of interested to know um like the percentage of people who are still using you know the virtual options um, honestly, we did not do a live streaming online of this show because it was so dark. So if we put a camera on in this room, basically you see nothing. <laughs> so it's, it was so dark because to enhance, to mm -hmm. focus on the light of the halo and mm -hmm. of the sculpture, we have to control the light of this space. So we did not do the live streaming. And the second one is about the people who visited this. I think maybe about two to three thousand people visited this space in the past four days. It only lasted for four days. And in the opening day, in the first night, we saw a long queuing. <laughs> we saw a long line queuing for the performance. It was astonishing. Um, but that room can only contain like one to 200 people at one time. So we have this kind of limitations. We, 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 we talk to people, we say sorry for not having let them in, <laughs> not, 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 not letting them in. And they are pretty disappointed because they all of them want to see the performance of this um, magician the combination of the magician and the sculpture. So after the performance, people were still standing in a line waiting to see this installation which is quite moving so every time i visited like every day i would go to the uh, the space and check is everything okay every time i can see a bunch of people at least 20 people standing in this room and they are just lingering <laughs> there and they don't want to leave so we set a loop uh, we set a loop of uh, audio uh, visual performance of this installation itself, the loop would be lasted like three to uh, two to three minutes. So people were just standing there watching them again and again, like they have this kind of uh, meditation feeling in this space. You can really calm down in this space. So I think people still prefer to feel something offline because it's so different even though a lot of people have seen this sculpture and seen this figure online uh, on the the, the the page of Dabei Zhou, the artist they already know what it is but it's so different to see it in the real world and so different to see this kind of larger mom presenting together 
For sure. And I think that like people really needed this. So it's really just, amazing. yeah, <laughs> congrats. It's, it's really successful. It sounds like, and even from just looking at it from the screen, it's really mesmerizing. And I think there is probably a meditative aspect, especially when you're engulfed by darkness and then, you know, these sensory lights, um, mm -hmm. I think that will really transport you from the current reality. And this is what people need. So congrats, mm -hmm. it's really well done, it sounds like. Um, and what, where's like the next uh, location that you guys are touring it to? We have several options like mm -hmm. Chengdu or Beijing or mm -hmm. probably Guangzhou. We are still thinking about that because mm -hmm. we, we prefer to have a longer period of uh, exhibition time because I think this time four days are too short for this kind of large installations people need more time to experience it so we are still thinking about uh, if any place can provide us uh, a longer time to present this is there any uh, appropriate context to have this installation that's what we're thinking about because basically we don't want to just be a blink <laughs> we so we, we, we want to present this to more and more people. And also we would like to invite different musicians and artists in this project. For example, I think this installation could have more possibilities with different types of musicians. Like uh, we could have the singer, we could have the uh, experimental musician, we could have this probably rock bands or something. It all depends. It depends on what will what would you like to perform because we have the installation. It the light uh, performance could be programmed uh, with a bunch of different forms, and uh, we could change the space by the form of light together. I think this trend is also like really picking up the musician with like interactive installation type. I don't know if you've seen Fortet and Squid Soup. So it's like a British uh, musician. I can send it to you later. And they will take over a place like, you know, in London, Alexandra Palace. Yeah. And then um, it's just flashing lights everywhere. And it's quite striking, uh, the venue and the space. So it kind of makes me think of that. Um, and then it also makes me think, because we're still in the present situation of COVID, kind of this would need to be a massive space to also accommodate, you know, distance, distancing and like kind of safety. <laughs> so is there also like kind of health and safety aspects that you have to consider? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, the reason that we can only contain one to two hundred people at one time is also because of the COVID thing. We have to have this kind of safe distancing uh, principles. So it would be good if we have longer time so more and more people can come to this space with a, in a safe situation. So that's what we think. And also if we just held it in a club like just for one night, I think that's not enough. <laughs> that's totally not enough. Sure. And I think it's also um, quite interesting how clearly you can't really have this as a virtual show. Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. something that you need to step into. Of course, we can watch it. Um, but it's something that makes me think, what are the challenges of taking some exhibitions virtual? Um, mm -hmm. Because it's like really you're missing key aspects of the experience. But then can those aspects be translated into an online viewing room? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we think, we're thinking about this because I've seen a lot of online viewing room in the past mountains, uh, including some summer shows of the art schools and also the fashion, fashion show. You know, in some fashion show would be published online as an online viewing room. And I think some fashion brand even did a better job than the artists. But um, I don't know, probably because the artists want to keep it simple and uh, just more efficient. So some of the some of the online viewing room, they look exactly like a web page. 
like a web page. They just posted pictures and、uh, audios and videos online. I think. I don't think it's only a viewing room. I think it's only a documentation of a portfolio. That's different. This kind of, I think, it, it, it's a it's a side of the lake of imagination. Only viewing room could be designed or could be created in a more creative way and with more imagination. For example, I have to mention the、uh, brand founded by a Chinese designer called Xu Zhi. Um, and also, I can send the link later.、Uh, he collaborated with a fashion curation agency called X Commons. They have this kind of、uh, fashion publishing online、uh, event online called just search X X Commons twenty twenty AW. So they have this virtual online room for their runway. Basically, for for their runway, so everyone could log in, could search the QR code, and get in this room. So、uh, I think the fascinating thing in this is you can choose the zone, different areas to different、um, brand designers. To to different designers, they have I think they had three different pathways. To three different designers, Xu Zhi is was was one of them, and they lead to different kind of、uh, different styles of the space. For example, the one is more like a、uh, city city view. The other one is more like a garden. The third one is happening in a museum, some kind of vibe, and、uh, the you can choose just on this online page. They form a really vivid space online, and you can have this kind of little interactive game. Like if you want to, because it's all happening on phone, it's not on on the, on the laptop. It's all happening on phone. So,、uh, based on the gravity system、uh, inhabited in, in on phone, you can have this game that you can pick different puzzles together. You have this this game. You you can just、uh, wave your forms and pick the different puzzles together and get the、uh, entrance in this space. I think it would have this feeling that you are the most important character in this game for the audience. They would have like they would have this feeling like I can control it. I'm the main character of this viewing tour. I can.、Uh, I'm. I'm not just、uh, pretty, pretty unnecessary. I. I think they will feel they. They are. It sounds、care. more. Yeah, it sounds more intimate. Exactly. Yeah.、It's, But then I also wonder, since, like you mentioned, I've also noticed that too, where it's if it's like design or fashion, it's almost easier to engage the audience somehow through their work. But then for fine arts, especially for pieces where it's paintings, it does kind of look like a stock room where you look at the images, image after、mm-hmm. image. But then with、um, artists working in two D mediums, particular in painting. Like, what are some ways around it to make this online viewing more interesting?、Um, I know that some of the artists' friends around me they've started doing their own virtual shows where they just walk around their studio with their、uh, video camera,、um, mm-hmm. and it kind of looks like a museum walkthrough or a mimic、mm-hmm. of that. But I wonder, like, are there things around creativity and overcoming these challenges that you've、mm-hmm. thought about?、Mm-hmm. Yeah,、uh, can I mention an organization called Slime Engine,、mm-hmm. founded in Shanghai years ago? They have this kind of、uh, online viewing room, maybe from two or three years ago, even before the quarantine. I mention them because they have they had this virtual online show.、Uh, they basically jump out of the white box. They have paintings, they have videos, but their space, their context is not in a, a black box, not like the museum, not like a video. It's happening on sea. <laughs> so their space were setting like a sea, seaside, sea, ocean. 
So all the things, were, all the links were set up or were hanged over the sea. I think that's what a virtual digital art can be. Slime engine, S L I M E engine. So, if you want to, like, present your paintings, I don't, I don't think that you have to hang it on a white wall or hang it on your video. You can scan it and create whatever you like. Like, if you are painting about uh, the flowers, painting about the landscapes. You can hang it in the virtual landscapes you would like to hang. This is what digital art can be. This this is what you can do with this. I like this aspect of using digital art to also enhance the experience of looking at your work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I say about um, most online viewing room is lack of imagination. So things that we our imagination were limited in the gallery space in the white box that we used to have but out of this white box what can we have we can have everything we can have the starry sky we can have the ocean we can have the mountain we can have the the rivers we can have anything you want so if what you are painting about what you want to have the uh, conversation with is totally up to you. So I think if we want to show our works on the online green room, use some imaginations, just create your own possibilities. That's what I think. That's really inspiring. Thanks. Um, and like I'm thinking about too, like because I got a notification telling me that the freeze viewing rooms are open now, and I remember every year I would take the train to London, walk through uh, Regent's Park, and go to the venue there to look at art. And this year I can have my coffee cup in my hand and just watch it from the comforts of my home. And I think it's great. It decreases the barrier of access. You know, you don't have to cost the cost, the time, also the entrance fee. All of that is gone, which it. In some ways is really great but then I was also thinking kind of what is lost in these virtual reviewing rooms and a central component I think of um, openings of art exhibits is the opening and kind of when you have these really fascinating conversations with artists curators and other people mm -hmm. and like I wonder too if there's going to be a replacement of like openings and if more things will be just taken virtual um, into the future and if you have um, thought about and ideas about kind of what the future would kind of look like yeah I think you're right in in terms of this the loss of communication with artists themselves but I think in this era we have the internet we have the, our phone we have the Instagram and everything if an artist want to talk to the audience they would always have the ways to talk talk to so uh, you, we can write emails, we can have this Zoom, uh, we can mm, having this telephone meeting, both of them could work. Uh, and also, it, it could be a challenge for all the artists because your work will not only be seen by the curators, by the buyers, but by the collector, you'll be seen by everyone, everyone online. But perhaps on phrase, your work will be seen by like 10,000 people. But on the internet, you work, your, your work will be seen by like 100 or 1,000 people, 1,100, I don't know, just thousands of hundreds of people online. So it will be a big challenge because you have not, you don't have the right, you don't have the ability to choose your target audience. I think it, it would be a really big challenge. That's the first thing about the future, what the future can be. And the second one, I think it's a benefit, just like what you've mentioned before. Uh, you don't have to pay the access fee. You don't have, and you don't have to take the trend. I think it's sustainable. It's really sustainable. It's green and safe. So if we can see the works online in different ways, why have, why, why should we take the trend? Why should we take the plan to see this show online? It, it, 
is 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 time and money saving. I mean, it's really and it's for, uh, environmental friendly. There's one benefit that I think, um, but it also bring uh, another thing is the. In this make the process more and more democratic. This bring democracy in art market. It means that if we don't have to pay the fee, if we don't need the invitation for the art market, so anyone can get in, anyone can have the access in. So this benefit also lead to the previous question that I talk about is the is the, the challenge that the artists would 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 have to face. I think that's the future of the art market of the art world. But I think everyone should be um, should be prepared for this. Should be prepared for this. If if you are not prepared for this, just focus on your work. So focus on work when you are ready. You get online and everything's ready. <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah, I think that there will also be a lot of these innovations and adaptations taking forward after COVID, and I think that's really exciting. And it was such a pleasure to talk to you today. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Beyond Codes and Aesthetics. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. Beyond Codes and Aesthetics is produced by Kohei and translations on Himalaya podcasts by Will Jung. Take care and see you next time.